Welcome to Amusement Sparks. Uh, this is the last completely new episode of Season 2, and my guest for today, return guest from the Scooby-Doo episode, it's Nick Robes. Say hi to the people. What's Nick. happening? Hello, people. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. And we're going to do things a little different today. Um, Nick and I really enjoy working together, so we're going to try something a little out of the box. We're going to be starting with the park design and then kind of fumbling our way into the theme instead of doing it in the reverse order where we start with a theme and then fumble our way into a park. So we'll see how that goes. Um, <laughs> it could be the greatest thing ever. Or the worst. And uh, I just won't post this episode. So <laughs> you never know. First things first, let's uh, do that little warm up. The tornado. Um, I'm very excited. No, I haven't gotten to do this yet. You haven't. Yeah, this is a season two edition. So uh, it's your season two debut. The first one we've got here, random pairing. Thank you to random.org. It's the ultimate collector's edition, Play-Doh. <laughs> oh, my mind just blew, dude. Yeah, like, that is. I don't like, even know. So like, you could. Well, okay. So <laughs> the thing that I remember most about Play-Doh, I, I know that like a lot. Uh, my girlfriend especially like does a lot of like sensory stuff with Play-Doh because yeah. like it's you know moldable and all this kind it's of stuff. It's coming back, I think, for like a just kind of like a fidget thing, like just something to be doing while you're watching TV or while you're hanging out. But the thing that like really got me when I was a kid was all the like the kitchen or like the ice cream mm-hmm. or like all the things that you could or you could make like superhero armor and right. stuff out of it. Right. So I wonder if you could have like a super like collector's edition mold set with mm-hmm. like a couple specialty colors. Yeah, you totally could. And it could be. I don't know if we're, we're trying to appeal to the collectors of Play-Doh, like where it's just here are all like the classic like a reference to every classic Play-Doh set from its you know first five years of operation or whatever. Or if you want to get even weirder with it, where like this is the ultimate James Bond collector's edition Play-Doh set. <laughs> and oh my god! Like a model replica of all of his cars that he's ever had and like each of his gadgets, but you can make them out of Play-Doh. And Star Wars, <laughs> yeah. uh, a, a Play-Doh Millennium Falcon. <laughs> Oh my gosh, it's almost like make your own Legos. Like if you have oh, wow. like all the different molds yeah. for like the different parts and mm-hmm. then you have to like assemble it and like stick them together. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And you could do, Dude. you know, like action figures where you mold like the, the left arm of C-3PO and you put it on Darth Vader's body and that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Um, Play-Doh, call us. <laughs> You've never seen Play-Doh like this before. <laughs> I wonder how that got its name. Play-Doh. Play-Doh. Oh, mm-hmm. dough as in dough, multiple dough. Play oh, with it. Oh, yeah. Play but with it's the dough. spelled D-O-H. Yeah, it's like Homer Simpson named it. Yeah. Dough! <laughs> Jinx. <laughs> Your Coke is in the mail. <laughs> um, Cool. Are you ready to move on to another one? Or is there anything else you want to talk about with Ultimate Collector's Edition Play-Doh? <laughs> oh, I think we nailed it. I think maybe it should be like uh, metallic gold, like a limited edition color. Yeah, I color think you can do a couple. To, in the different sets, you can have a specific mm. color for that set. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Let's try something. I'm yeah. going to count to three. Yeah. And we're going to say a toy word. Okay. okay. We're both going to say a toy word? Yeah, we're both going to say it simultaneously. Okay. All right. Just clear your brain. Clear your brain. <sighs> All right. All right. Ready? Mm-hmm. One, two, three. Steering Atlantis. wheel. Atlantis. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> An Atlantis steering wheel? <laughs> Whenever I clear my mind, the first thing I ha- that happens is I'm deep underwater. <laughs> Does that happen for everyone else? <laughs> one. One, two, two, three. Baton. I didn't think of one. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. All right. I'm going to think of one, and then... <laughs> this whole counting three thing is really throwing me. I'm not used to it. <laughs> oh my god, it's so much fun to do to people randomly because they're just like, wait, what? Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> I wasn't ready. Yeah, although it builds up your uh, like improv skills, you know, your you just go with it kind of vibes, which are that's important. It's an important skill to have. One, two, three, magic eight van. ball, van. Ooh, magic eight ball van. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, that can happen. I mean, so fundamentally, a magic eight ball is a container with liquid in it with a dice in it that's all that Mm -hmm. is why is it always round why is it shaped like an eight ball it's not billiards related at all you know or (laughs) it's kind of weird why is it always in that i guess the magic the mystique of an eight ball yeah because it's like the linchpin of the game right yeah yeah that's true it seals your fate fate depends right right it's the fate ball 
So the uh, the uh, yes, maybe uh, in the future, possibly uh, is hooked up to the wheels. Right. OK. So in old school fashion, you have to like rev it up mm-hmm. by pulling it backwards. Yeah. And then when you let it go, the wheels spin and it spins the thing. And then when it stops, you get your answer. That's pretty cool. It could just have like a um, a turbine kind of thing in there, like a fan that that is propelled by the wheels moving forward and that just kind of jumbles up the water and rolls the dice that's pretty sweet and you could have you know the a-team one the mystery machine one you just collect or you know collaborate with hot wheels or whoever is making uh little pullback van vehicles and there you go you could do a a blank version for toy customizers who want to paint their own to to look like you know whatever van they've that's always big wanted. right now right i think so or at like least fun- funko, funko oh, yeah right, right? collectible uh toys are definitely really big right now even like the thomas the tank engine has like little blind boxed toys where you don't know what it's going to be until you open it so it's basically like some of them look like a thomas train but it's just covered in graffiti or like some of them are like glow in the dark and it looks pretty cool some of them have like a skeletal shape on the outside they're pretty cool looking it's like they got a bunch of designer toy people to like design thomas the tank engine cars (laughs) it's pretty rad hey what are you guys doing this weekend (laughs) who's the conductor now i don't know it's a great question i haven't watched Mm. it uh, since i was a boy are you carlin or ringo i prefer carlin personally of course Mm. um i like the laconic ringo (laughs) i like that he was always just kind of like well yeah that world i think would be hard to live in inhabit just it would make me so uncomfortable knowing that there are giant sentient trains that i'm like making my living off like are they getting paid (laughs) i feel like they're uh, it's a little slavish. Room and board? Room and board, I guess, yeah. And also, you're... they don't have much options Free will. because they're... they're attached to the rails. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's doing them a service because it's taking care of them. Yeah, that's fair. You can only go back and forth along this this track, so we might as well mm. shove you full of stuff and uh, let you take it somewhere. <laughs> Give you a fuel. I mean, unlike Pokemon, where they can live in right. the universe independently, in, wild, in the wild. like these trains, I don't think they can maintenance themselves. Mm, you know, that's a good point. Yeah, it's kind of weird. It's like a weird symbiotic relationship. Yeah, we turned it around. Bro. Yeah, I don't think we're supposed to think that deeply about Thomas, but I mean, it still works, I guess. If you, how do they reproduce? <laughs> 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 oh goodness um yeah that's interesting (laughs) and wouldn't you think they would always only ever see each other's butts because you know they've got a face on one end a rear end on the other and if they're all kind of i don't know they're on the same track it'd be a little awkward yeah they always talked next to each other Right. right how did that i don't see many trains parked side by side like, like that awkward, engine. like, side glance. Like, yeah. I've oh. never actually seen your face before. <laughs> and I still can't really see it because we're side to side. Like, they're directly to your side, and you can't turn your head. You can only look and see people out the corner of your eye. It might make you really, like, scared, I think. Like, who is that? I can't turn my head. That's, like, a horror movie thing. If you can't move your head, like, if you're totally stuck, straight facing forward all the time, and you can't move your body side to side either, that'd be terrifying. And everything's always to the sides of you? Yeah. You never have made yeah. eye contact with another train your whole life. Unless they're coming right at you, in which case you're going to die. Or unless they're on a tandem track going the opposite direction. Yeah, if they're going backwards. Hmm. Ready to design a an unthemed park? Yes. Okay. How how should we start this? Do you have any any plans for uh, the inception of this this beast? Well, okay. Let's let's pull out your list, the list of things that you like the parks to do. The motifs that keep rearing their heads throughout these episodes. When you're doing a fictional park where budget is not an option or not a limitation, I think that you kind of end up at the same places as far as what does. 2017 need in their themed entertainment and Mm. um i do have a list somewhere i could actually pull up but some of the things off the top of my head there's always the kind of interactive element the 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 agency which was a huge like breakthrough for this podcast when we got to the scooby-doo's mystery town episode where we were like it's really just all about guest 
having agency, like them being able to make the decisions that impact their interaction with the rest of the park. So I think that's a really big one. Um, and then also something that kind of follows you around as far as having an, an experience tracker, like what have you already done today? What have you unlocked? That kind of thing where your, your personal progress throughout the park uh, matters, you know? Yeah. Creating like self-expression. Sure. Right. Right. And yeah, also the, the ability to make different choices that won't have a huge impact, but just kind of stylistic differences. Like in uh, the Dungeons and Dragons one, you could choose what kind of class you wanted and that would determine what weapon you had. Being able to customize your avatar kind of a thing. Yeah. Yeah. So those are some of the some of the key ones that I think are really important. So if we want to try to keep those things in mind and then stay uh, theme agnostic and just kind of make <laughs> progress in that dimension, I think that would be kind of interesting. All right. Here's an idea. Okay. Uh, what is an obvious entrance element? Mm-hmm. Like for when you first pull up, you get to the parking lot, you walk through this yeah. thing uh-huh um i think that portals are always kind of interesting or yeah, a uh, gate of some kind a gate yeah or even like a security checkpoint is kind of kind of cool and we're used to doing that at like airports and stuff or like going from one country into another country um mm. so it, it's got a little bit of like realism if it's kind of trying to blend the fictional world with the real world then going through some kind of you know border patrol kind of thing would be kind of uh believable I don't know if that's okay. any fun. <laughs> no, no, no. I like that because what do you end up with? You end up with like an initiation ceremony, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, of some yeah. kind. Right. Welcome to uh, the world. Crossing a threshold. Sure. And another thing that's that's kind of always present in a lot of uh, of the most immersive fiction, in my opinion, is when you take someone from a, a a normal place, like a muggle, and you they get the letter to go to Hogwarts, that kind of a thing. Like that's a really great chapter one of the story. It's like you're a normal person doing normal people things, but here's an invitation to go to this magical, wonderful thing. Instead of just you walk through the door and you're in a different world, it's like, let's address that. Let's talk about how you got here. I think that's important. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So let's throw let's say, okay, so we have a parking lot, we have mm-hmm. a shuttle and the shuttle is actually the entrance. Okay. So like, which I think was uh, the Dungeons and Dragons thing. That was also in the TV show, right? You yeah, there's a... a roller coaster. You get on the roller coaster. And in the TV show, there's a cartoon of Dungeons and Dragons in like the late 80s, I think. And they were on a roller coaster and something went wrong and they got teleported into the world of Dungeons and Dragons. So then <laughs> that was like a late addition to that episode was like someone on Reddit, I think, brought that up. And we're like, oh, crap, let's do that. Let's do you first get to the park. They check your bags, and then you get into a roller coaster, and when you come out the other side, everything is themed. The roller coaster suddenly is themed instead of just being a generic roller coaster, and everything you can see 360 degrees is Dungeons & Dragons related. So, yeah, I think having the, the um, what's it called, the little transit to get to the park, having that mm. be the welcome aboard kind of thing, and then we can get yeah. you fully prepared by the time we actually get there. That'd be kind of cool. Yeah, and, I mean, you can take care – like – while people are seated in an individual thing, mm-hmm. I feel like that's so much more um, efficient for like checking bags and stuff. <laughs> right? you know, like you don't have to all be in a line waiting. Like yeah. we have to all get there. Just mm-hmm. get in the seat, put your bag next to you. It yeah. looks and make sure you don't have a gun and then we <laughs> right. move on. So are you think it's totally individual? Like you get in your own little car, your own little ride vehicle, or is it you and your, your family of three other people? At least your own like little like seat within mm-hmm. like maybe a row. That sounds cool. And then um, there could just be like hidden cameras, and the the security people can be like, okay, they've got a bag. We'll have to talk to them about that. Or this guy <laughs> has a, a sword in his mouth. We'll have to address that before he gets in. <laughs> that will have to be addressed at some point. <laughs> <laughs> or the whole ride could go through a metal detector, um, or like an X ray, and you know they're like, well. Obviously, that's the shape of the ride vehicle itself. We have been trained to mm-hmm. ignore that part. We look at the, the human-shaped object and see what kind of sketchy things it has with it. <laughs> <laughs> a severely enlarged liver. <laughs> oh, God. You, that is so horrible. You go through like a security scanner, and they're like, I think you have cancer. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm not entirely sure what that looks like because I've only seen the x-ray, but right. I know in all the x-rays, I've never seen one look like that. <laughs> Should see a doctor, bro. Yeah, you have a second head growing inside your lung. I, I, I <laughs> there's a skull in there. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> I inhaled my twin in utero. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yikes! Oh, that's crazy. 
Um, um, interesting. Yeah, so <laughs> this ride, I, I like this idea of the shuttle yeah. taking you in, and then like that's like a ride in itself, mm-hmm. kind of where you like enter something, and then you're like in the area. That sounds cool. And um, so basically, they could be. Uh, it's like a tree that kind of branches out all throughout this whole parking lot, and so everyone, you know, at the end of each parking aisle there's an entrance to this thing. I don't know if it's like, maybe it's underground kind of thing, like an underground tunnel, or if it just like kind of looks like a bus, like a shuttle, but it goes from all these extreme points where people could park and it funnels them all in down this one specific hallway to enter the park. So then you can have all the really specific theming can be like in that hallway. So you Mm. kind of see like, okay, I still see other people's cars or you, you know what? You could just have no windows. You get into this totally enclosed vehicle and immediately you get immersed in the world through the audio and maybe there's a screen in there or um, some like immersive literature is in there. I don't know exactly how we would position. This I'm like. also I'm obsessed with uh, eccentric billionaire intro videos. <laughs> Hi, welcome to my vision. I'm Lamont Dillington. <laughs> Did you just make that name up? Is that a real thing? Yeah, I made that name. OK, up. <laughs> Lamont Dillington. That's very believable. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if we're going to build this, uh, the theme, like an original IP, <laughs> then I think this could work. Um, but then again, if we can want to tack on a, a theme at the end, we could also try to do that as well. Like try to replace Lamont Dillington with <laughs> another eccentric billionaire type of personality. <laughs> Welcome to Richard Branson world. <laughs> oh, geez. Why hasn't he done that yet? Yeah, that wow. kind of seems like it would be, he, he does everything else. Yeah. <laughs> And he's into, like, thrills, you know? He should do a, a high thrills theme park. Yeah, it would be awkward to just have a uh, an amusement park called Virgin, though. <laughs> yeah, that's that's awkward. Welcome to Virgin World. Virgin country. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's weird. <laughs> but, oh well. So, now... All right, I like this. I, I like okay. where this is going. We got the people I like... in the door. <laughs> I like I like the eccentric billionaire, uh, mm-hmm. you know, like being like, "Hey, welcome to this thing." Yeah. So you make it in, the door goes like, and you walk. Oh man. What? Like I'm kind of thinking like I want it, like I want that ride to be like super like futuristic. Like now that you said like enclosure, mm-hmm. I'm seeing like very smooth black, uh, egg shape, ovular, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and then but then when it like mm-hmm. open. <laughs> You're, it's like the inside of like a ginormous tree. Whoa, cool. I think maybe because you said the word tree. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, I guess so. I was thinking of meaning that all the branches kind of lead to the one main trunk. Like that's the entrance to the park. Um, but that's kind of cool. We're building this baby. Let's make it a tree. <laughs> so are we shrinking down? Are we really small scale? Or is it just a gigantic tree? The tree Giant of life. tree. Giant tree. That's pretty sweet. It's also like such a fun thing for like an epicenter because now you can go into the different areas that are part of the tree. So you're always in the tree, but then like each area could have its own like yeah. funky thing. So is this like a combination of, of sci-fi and nature? Cause mm. I think that's a cool cross section, you know, like if you go up to the upper branches and there's, you know, spaceships going off and like uh, high tech, like dirigibles launching and that kind of thing, that could be kind of cool. Yeah. If there's like space travel going on. Here's a weird one. Okay. Did you, did you read a lot of young adult fiction as a kid? Or not uh, even young adult fiction, kid fiction? I read an, an amount. Yes, I, I would say so. I was really into choose your own adventure stories and like goosebumps and that kind of thing. Did you read Bruce Coville stuff at all? I don't think so. Like, Let me look at Google and image search here. Uh, my teacher is an alien. My teacher flunked the oh, planet. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. I um, left my sneakers in Dimension X. Yes. I can't think of any specific titles, but I remember that series because – uh, full disclosure, I thought I was from Mars until I was in fourth grade. <laughs> it was just kind of an instinct up until I was in uh, first grade. And then mm. I was a new kid at the school. And this guy was like, I heard about you before you got here. And I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah, you came from Mars, right? And I was like, actually, yeah. <laughs> How did you know that? Funny, funny you should mention funny that. Funny you should mention because, <laughs> yeah. So this this one student, like no one else my whole life had ever said that. It was just a thing I kind of knew. You know, it's like I don't really – I don't, I don't feel like I am my parents' kid. Um, I don't, I feel like that's everyone it, else is different from me. And then this kid told me and like affirmed that. And then it's like, it only takes one person to tell you that your dreams are real. And then they are, you know? So, so then that messed me up for like three more years. And I was like, you know what? I kind of do look like my parents now that I'm you know, uh, <laughs> older than like six years old. Oh the, man. The, the moment I got super weird about it. Cause I did the same thing. Um, <laughs> uh, 
But I I don't know how or why this happened, but I was in like third grade and uh, naturally you have to line up to go anywhere. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're like in line on our way from one classroom to another gym or who knows. And I like have this vivid memory of like I kind of like fainted Mm -hmm. and saw like (laughs) like a weird sky with lightning. What? Yeah. Oh my and god. So, like, I was like, when I came to, I was like, that's like a message from my home world. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there's something to that when you feel kind of like an outsider. It's like, yeah, you know, there's I've got a family out there somewhere in the universe, and and when you're that young and your connection to reality is somewhat limited, you're like, I'm sure that you know by the time I'm like ten, there will be space travel, and I'll be able to to go to my own home planet and figure out <laughs> this whole thing. Yeah, right. When you're that optimistic and your imagination is that, like, lucid, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And yeah. there's a lot of, like, special stuff, you know, like, I'm special kind of stuff. Right, absolutely. And and, and you are an individual and just mm-hmm. exploring life, I feel like it makes you feel like you're totally independent and totally different than your peers in a certain way. Or like, maybe not everyone feels like that, but I definitely felt that way. And, you know, I had, like, bright blonde hair and neither of my parents did. And I'm like, there's something about this. Something is going on that's, like, kind of weird. No way. Um, but, yeah, those books, I really loved those. Whenever there was, like, it's a normal, like, school and then someone is an alien and then they're trying to mess everything up. Um, yeah, that was, that was a cool book series. What was the author's name again? Bruce Coville, Bruce double Coville. L-E. Okay. Um, the only reason I brought it up uh-huh. uh, is because I wanted to talk about it. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, in the – so they had like their stand-in for the Spock character in one of the series, okay. which I think was the one that started with uh, – the second book was I Left My Sneakers in Dimension X. The third <laughs> book, they go to this planet called Mentat, and there are these like sort of like um, – you may have Vulcans, okay. uh, <laughs> basically, <laughs> yeah. but they have snouts and stuff. It was fun. But they live in like this giant tree and that serves Whoa. as like the teaching center and like the classrooms and like this sort of facility where they can like train these like uh, people with uh, mental abilities. That's cool. That sounds amazing. I, I love that the tree has kind of like a, a mystic quality to it. And I think when you combine mm-hmm. that with the future and with science fiction, it's kind of cool because like trees have been around for so much longer than humanity. And when we look at these, like, you know, our, our fictional versions of the future, it's always very human centric, but Mm. you know, trees have been around longer than us. Why wouldn't it be more like tree based? I feel like they're more significant than, than humans in a certain way. Um, or they're more longstanding. They're more timeless. So them making it into the future makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Trippy. I like, yeah. (laughs) So let's, let's just have fun. Let's say like, okay, so, the the doors open. You're in this giant tree, mm-hmm. meaning that you can go to like any one of these areas. Yeah. Let's just get hyper specific and let's say like, all right, we're going to go to this area. How okay. do we get there? How do you transport yourself around there? I'm saying yeah. the the main part of this is being like a big open plaza, like you can walk around and you know there's maybe like fountains or whatever. Um, mm. So it's it feels like a mall right now, which I know is very like uh, 20th century America kind Atrium. of atrium. Sure, an atrium. There you go. That sounds more sci-fi. Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say the food court, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, the atrium. You explore the atrium. Um, I think it should be like really hygienic, but then also a lot of the accents are made out of wood because I feel like those mm. two things pair really well together. Almost like they're like seamlessly integrated. Like I like that because I feel like there's a lot of kind of... Um, nature that can be expressed through like circuitry and i don't know there's a lot of parallels there i know that it's like they're both very generic kind of uh motifs as far as like decor goes but i think you can kind of do some cool branching tree based decor that would be really cool looking so anyway how do we get around i think on foot is fine um Mm -hmm. but then also having like a a a tram system or maybe elevators elevators always feel really futuristic even though they're like (laughs) pretty old technology like um, cool oh but like uh space it's, it's, it's well it's so it's like a um like a technological like pod mm-hmm. that's that's uh pulled up and down by vines oh yeah seeds dude they're all seeds like the the egg-shaped yeah. vehicle you're talking about those could be like shaped like an almond i think that's a kind of cool like spaceship kind of uh naboo starfighter almost type of design yes. that could be kind of cool um sweet i like that um 
I was thinking about the, uh, I forget what they're called, like the, the space elevator thing, like how they're planning on getting like uh, tools and stuff out of our atmosphere by having like a micro, super strong, super thin string that just goes up to a space station. And then they can have like an elevator that basically just drives up that little tiny string. It seem, doesn't make any sense to me, but I've heard smart people that talk about this. super cool. I think it's called space elevator. Um, but basically just having super high tech elevators where the, the strand that's pulling it is like, seems insanely too small. Like it seems dangerous, but it's just, mm. it's just high tech enough that it'll actually work. You know what though? Yeah. If these elevators are going along the exterior, or, I'm sorry, the interior walls, but they are yep. like right against the wall, we mm. could actually have hidden, um, the actual elevator mechanics are hidden within the wall. It's like a track in the wall, but you don't see it. Exactly. So it looks like you're being pulled up by this like spider thread, like this really tiny cord, but actually you're mounted to the wall. You just don't realize it. <laughs> That's cool. I like that idea. That spider thread idea. Yeah. Like if this whole interior tree ha- has like like interactive elements, like very like Harry Potter world where you can use the wand and mm-hmm. like stuff can happen. Yeah, yeah. Like what if they're like, like small, like if you see like a knot in a tree, like maybe that knot can talk to you or you can like play a game with it. That's or something. awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. I like that. And especially if, if the whole theme incorporates technology already, then it won't mm. be too wonky if you have to hold up your, you know, your gauntlet. You have like a little Buzz Lightyear uh, <laughs> typable pad thing on your on your wrist. You can, I don't know, use that to communicate or to trigger uh, these different interactive parts it won't feel that wonky because it's like this is a high-tech world of the future you have to use your technology you can't just like it's not just going to recognize you you have to kind of trigger it yourself what if oh my gosh okay so now we have so the gauntlet idea right okay yeah what if what if you can choose three different types which are like uh uh, different themed ones so like one like feels more like wood more organic one Mm -hmm. feels more technological i like that and like one feels more like I don't know something. A third, a third. Option. <laughs> I don't have time right now. I'm too. I'm too, I'm too busy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but like, you get to like choose your allegiance mm-hmm. when you go into the park, and like which gauntlet you can have, and then that like slightly affects like things that you can do there. So like, you could go one day and get the tree one, and then you can do these things, or you get the technological one, and then you can do these things. That's great. I think that kind of captures the like um, toy to life kind of thing. Like if you've ever played like Skylanders, I know I play video games for children, but, um, Skylanders, (laughs) Lego dimensions, Disney infinity. It's like, you get to pick the character that best represents you and they can access their own unique parts of the world. And it's kind of cool to just experiment with trying out different, different, uh, abilities. You know what I mean? Mm. You get to customize your avatar a little bit. Like we said, is one of our goals. I like that. And I think if your culture is built on two huge central, uh, facets, you know, technology and nature, then different people will align themselves slightly differently within that, that spectrum from one to the other. That's great. Yeah. Dude, that's cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you mm-hmm. take this elevator up. Yes. Uh, it's like a cool, like transparent seed pod oh, dude. that feels like s- somewhere in between like, uh, like an organic, like amber or something, mm-hmm. you know, like a hardened organic property or like, you know, plexiglass, like technologically. Oh, cool. Like, it feels in between there. Yep. Uh, so you go up and it takes you to a branch. Okay. This branch specifically. So like it like, oh my God, I really want it to like melt. You know what I'm <laughs> yes, like, please. So like it goes like, blah, 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 and then you get to walk out and then it's like. Blah, 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 blah. I've got three ideas that you just triggered. Um, one of them is if we want to have them kind of have different type of like different skins, like there's the technology elevator and then there's like the seed elevator. Um, you could use your little, um, device on your wrist and say, you know, request an elevator at, at bay three. And I want it to be a seed elevator. Then just under the ground, there's just some people who just keep swapping out the tracks. Like, do I put, you know, they just have two different different ride vehicles and they're just swapping out which one is going up, which bay. It wouldn't be Mm -hmm. that hard to do. I don't think it'd be like a train junction a little bit. Like, okay, here's a, all of the technology ones are on this track. All the seed ones are on that track. Where is this one going? Where's that one going? Yeah, that wouldn't be too huh. hard to do, I don't think. So you would just yeah. request which one, and then it just comes up a second or two later. It'd be really cool. Uh, then, if we want to have it um, so that the colors kind of change as you go and make it like a really beautiful color-changing kind of experience, if mm. there is a, a big component of each elevator that's like translucent plastic, then maybe every five feet as you go up the elevator, there are a ton of lasers that are a specific color going out. So you can't see them from the ground. But, but it'll, it it'll like... light up your vehicle. So, like, your oh. vehicle's red in for five feet, and then it turns, like, purple for five feet. That'd be really sweet. 
that's super cool. Yeah, I, I like that a lot. I just I love translucent stuff, especially if you can change the color of it. Going back to uh, Skylanders again, a lot of them are have translucent parts, and the base that mm. they're on lights up, and it changes like those translucent parts light up that color, and it's like it's amazing. <laughs> and then um, to have the door kind of feel like it's melting open, it could just be a you know doors usually just have the two sliding pieces like elevator doors, and there's mm-hmm. like the front piece and then there's the back piece there's the inner door which is attached to the actual elevator and then there's the outer door on each floor so those both open up right we could just Mm -hmm. have maybe three or four layers like that and they move apart separately so that it's more fluid yeah the silhouette of them is kind of gooey shaped so they like move in a gooey kind of uh slime type of manner (laughs) i like that oh boy yeah i like that too that sounds fun i really like the idea of these elevators i think they seem really uh whimsical well, and I love the idea of, like, seeing them going up in the atrium, you know? Yeah. Like, you're in the atrium, and like, you can chilling, and you can see, like... People going on their own mission. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's exciting. You used a word. Let's commit to it. Mission. Okay. So, you, you use these pods to go to missions. hmm So, each of these different branches is a different mission. Yeah. I like that, and that's kind, so, of, kind of like some other parks we've done before. Like... D&D had the different, like, I forget what they were called, like the encounter zones or something, where you go on a specific quest, and it's like each area is set up like one specific um, American Gladiators uh, arena. So you can go to that quest if you want to, or a different quest into a totally different experience. So it's like there's different, you know, obstacle courses, different experiences in different rooms throughout the park. So if you want to go on this one specific mission, you have to take this one specific elevator to get there. What if they're jobs... So like they're jobs that happen in mm-hmm. this tree. Yeah. And they're like they're like you could do uh like different types of puzzles mm-hmm. for like different types of personality types. Cool. So it's like, oh, you like spatial reasoning. Mm-hmm. We have <clears throat> uh it could even be <clears throat> sorry, I have phlegm in my throat. Um each branch, like you could have like solo things where like you can go by yourself if you want, and you can do like this kind of job, quote unquote, mm-hmm. but it's really just a puzzle. Or you could have like three different you could have a, a this takes three people and then one person needs to have like good spatial reasoning one person needs to have like a good memory and one person needs to you know so like then you can like try out these different things and then work together or work separately so like each one is like a different puzzle in this tree and like you're learning stuff like like the whole purpose of this is like this institution is like trying to like learn these like ancient secrets or something dude that sounds so cool I just got flashbacks to Wally. Have you seen that film? I haven't. I uh, get very emotional. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. I hear that one's gonna. <laughs> it's a good movie. It really is. And and as like a you know big advocate for the planet and stuff, and someone who's really interested in the future, I thought that movie was fantastic. But anyway, um, there's a part where they start discovering the past of humanity that they had totally forgotten about, like their history. They were focused on just like living in space. They kind of had forgotten about what Earth was and what culture on Earth was like, and so. <clears throat> there's a one point where the sorry i got some of your phlegm it's from that coke i sent <laughs> the captain finds these logs of like basically a wikipedia of earth culture and like gets gets really into it and so i think part of that might be kind of an interesting theme where it's like you're trying to uncover ancient history and we need people to kind of sort through those like uh the the data to get that knowledge out and whether it's yeah whether it's for the good of the whole culture like if that information will then be passed on into the school system or if it's just for you to discover personally that kind of remains to be decided but um in wally at the very end like the the like post credits thing basically yeah it's a minor spoiler i guess but they (laughs) they end up rebuilding their culture with keeping nature as an important integral part of it instead of just a stepping stone to make progress like You know, like the giving tree kind of thing. Like, maybe he should have just been more considerate from the beginning. And they get that chance to, like, start over again and, like, keep the giving tree alive, basically. So I think Mm. that could be kind of the origin of this place. It's like, what if technology was built to supplement nature instead of going against it? Which I know that's, that's like, a tale as old as time. Um, (laughs) Like, you know, the whole uh, Avatar thing, the whole pocahontas thing like there's a lot of those kinds fern of gully. stories fern gully that's the main one i was trying to think of actually i couldn't think of the name but yeah technology versus nature why not technology with and, nature yeah. yeah yeah it would just, yeah it'd be like crazy if, if if you were like learning like this tree mm-hmm. because like all these there are these interactive elements like this tree is like not just like one living tree but it's like 
a symbiosis of all these different things. And so like when you're interacting with these like little dudes everywhere, like that's also part of the tree, but also its own thing. And then like very easily you could have these puzzles be also like a motion ride or like, you know, so like you could get at, at every level of fun and or interaction within each one of like the little puzzles. That's awesome. Yeah. That sounds really fun. One of the games that I love to play, uh, is uh parallax i have not played that so it's a first person puzzle game so you're walking around in this world but you have to like uh hit this thing which then flips this bridge and it's all like very minimalist looking and like super cool and i feel like you could have like some fun like interactive like you walk through this puzzle and Mm -hmm. you're you're trying to learn from this tree yeah that sounds really cool and I like the idea of it, of you having to, like, take action in order to make yourself a path to get mm-hmm. through, to complete it. Which, that's like, you know, Legend of Zelda, every dungeon is kind of like that. Like, you can't get through here yet, you have to go through the progression. And, um, yeah. yeah, I think that, that it's pretty easy to, like, draw a parallel between the process of learning something and, like, a Legend of Zelda style, you can't go through here yet because you don't have the, the boots yet. Or you can't go through here yet until you get, you know, the specific tool that will let you progress. So the whole game yeah. is basically going from point A to point B to point C, but you have to do it in a specific order. Like you have to understand this technique before you can get through this area. And then once you get through this area, you can learn this technique, which lets you make further progress. Like I think that's a really cool thing to have that kind of progression tree uh, at your own. And that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that can get logged on your gauntlet. Wow. Wait, log and tree just happened. <laughs> progression tree <laughs> and log. <laughs> oh, that's fun. No, yeah, that's cool. Um, Man, this sounds like a cool place. Um, So is there anything outside of the tree? Like, if you look at this park from Google Maps, is it just a big, uh, all you see is leaves? You know what I mean? Or is there, are there other satellite locations out there? Are there other parks? Is there a big water area? Or is this tree, like, floating in space in our our narrative? Yeah, I do like the idea of floating in space in the narrative, but I also like the idea of going into the root system and there is water down there. Cool. Yeah, so you could, could have like, like a cool cave. little water land. Yeah, a cave system with some water going through it. So maybe it's it's on a planet, but like the planet is uh, the diameter of the planet is the same as the diameter of the tree, or like a uh, a tree when it has all the roots in a little bag. Like uh, if you want to buy your own Christmas tree or whatever, mm. it would look kind of like that. But yeah, I don't know. Maybe instead of having a bag, it's just a really small planet. I like that too, and I always love incorporating water as well. Um, and then you could have like kind of uh, cave paintings. You could have some really cool looking stuff. The way that it's grown, there are like shapes and images and things coming out and like stories or something. Exactly. And it can be, it can look like gemstones, like geodes, and then also like LEDs and circuitry incorporated together. Whew, mm. man, I'm getting goosebumps. This is a, this is an exciting, exciting world. This place is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, this, this, uh, doing this podcast just makes me comfortable with not being able to ever go to these things i really want to go to because it happens you know like every three weeks i'm like i want to go here so bad but i never will <laughs> oh well let's make a new one <laughs> um that sounds this really also cool. might be technologically the most ambitious i agree yeah um you're right it we might have to the wait a infrastructure few years. <laughs> alone is huge yeah true very true it's got to be gigantic because you know for there to be an elevator that that doesn't look goofy. It's got to be like, you know, six or more stories tall. It's going to have to be really mm. tall. Um, or you could just have really small elevators, I guess. If they're just elevators for, you know, maximum of three people, you know, if it's a 500 pound capacity elevator, then that could be pretty small. Mm. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is a fun one. This is really going well. Have you ever seen uh, the Studio Ghibli film called Castle in the Sky? I have seen parts of it okay cool. uh, i haven't seen the whole thing yeah but it's like there's like uh i know this is gonna sound dumb there's a castle in the sky <laughs> there, right there is a castle <laughs> in the sky in that one <laughs> yeah um and the the like you know the main story takes place on it. it's like this big uh castle it's got like a fan like a huge propeller on the bottom doesn't make any sense like mm. from a physics perspective but this giant propeller is keeping this thing in the air but there's this huge tree going out growing out of the top of it and there's just some really interesting stuff because that, that whole island is like an ancient lost technology that can make cities float. But then there's also all these like natural elements that have grown over it. And it's almost like um, 
I forget. There was like a Discovery series a while back called like After After Humans or something like that. I forget what it's called, but it's like oh, where what stuff if, gets overgrown. Yeah, it's like what if all the humans were gone? What would Earth look like in three hundred years? And so it's just totally overgrown, and like nature's taken over everything, and it, it just looks really cool. Um, mm. Having you know moss growing over computer screens, for example, like that kind of visual aesthetic, I think is really fascinating, especially if it's like. Um, the humans are still in charge. Like we're okay with this happening. Like we want or this part of it or part of it. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, a yeah, yeah. integrated into a, a more symbiotic whole. Mm-hmm. I do like the idea. This just popped into my head Yeah, let's do it. of like when you're walking around the individual branches and stuff, there are some things that like, it sounds like something's happening like right around the corner yeah. or like always like oh, something man. like happens behind you, mm-hmm. but like you never really get to see it. Ooh. There's always just, like, something happening. That's a really cool idea, keeping the mystery alive. Um, Man, that's great. And maybe there could be an overall, like, narrative, like, secret agenda that, you know, no one really knows about unless you uncover this. You can find, like, strands of this this mystery that, that are hidden very subtly in certain places. So it's only for, like, the diehards to, like, even realize there's a next level to the narrative. You could also have multiple mysteries. Uh Uh-huh, that's true. There could be some obvious ones where it's like, oh, yeah, um, I mean, even just to, like, figure out how to use the elevator system. You know, maybe there's not directions printed anywhere. You have to go through one of the really basic adventures or, like, uh, a tutorial to try to figure out, you know, how do you get around this place? How do you interact with this? What does this dang gauntlet do? All that kind of stuff. and like you and like maybe even like getting to the root system, you mm-hmm. know, it was like, oh, well, you kind of had to you had to like pull that moss curtain back, which yeah. you thought was a wall, you know, that's like, awesome. And that's not necessary. Like you can just like get, you know, figure yeah. out how to use the elevator, get in the elevator and go play puzzles with your friends. Mm-hmm. But like also like, oh, there's like this story and like all these elements and you can uncover them by yourself if you want. And like <laughs> that sounds get, awesome. Like this whole picture. Yeah, that's really cool. I like that idea a lot, and I like the, the symbiotic relationship between humans and plants using futuristic technology. I think it'd be kind of cool to have like an educational area where you kind of learn about how they do this food production in the future. Um, mm. Like in uh, Star Wars, when they are talking about how they raise the clones, I always thought that was truly like fascinating. Like, how would you do, you know, raising humans without parents in the future using high tech? stuff like what would that process be like if you could remove humans who like the parents arguably either make or break the the kid generally (laughs) you know Mm -hmm. if you have really terrible parents you're probably not going to be as like fortunate as the average person with great parents for example so if you can remove parents from the equation how could you streamline that process and make it more fair and more likely that everyone will be successful i thought that was a really fascinating part of those movies and um so think about that as far as like how do we grow food? How do we harvest food in this like very nature centric futuristic world? That could be super cool because that basically is like uh, the coolest food court ever. You know, <laughs> like you're going to eat, yeah. but like there's also like this super crazy element to right. it. Right. You can you can learn the the story of it by going through. You know, there's maybe a tour of the facilities, and um, there's some really cool stuff out there in in real life where they're doing like robotic farming, um, mm. where people are using like really cheap. Uh, electronics to to kind of monitor like humidity and all these different farming conditions and then just they just go out on their little track and just water whichever plants need watered that day and then they go back it's it's really cool they can they can monitor everything and just do it like have the robot just take care of the garden it's it's really fascinating stuff well and, yeah and i have a friend who does aquaponics so I oh, mean, he cool. has like a garden inside his house that's wow. like giving him spinach and greens yeah. and carrots and all this stuff that he can eat. Like he can literally. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. Consume. Right. And it's really cool. And I feel like no matter how far humanity progresses, uh, we're still going to be fascinated by like how nutrition works and how the human body has, has learned to coexist with just the plants that grow on earth. Like mm. it's, just, I don't know. There's some crazy stuff about like, how does, it's just weird that things just kind of work. You know, you could you could know nothing and just kind of wander around and, like, eat random stuff off the ground, and you'd be okay. <laughs> like, you'd probably survive. <laughs> That's kind of nuts. Yeah. I mean, don't eat rocks and stuff, but, like, if it's green, you can just kind of eat it. I mean, unless it's, like, weed. I guess there are certain things you don't want to eat, but um, it's just weird how our our planet suits us. But also, like, we kind of have built-in systems to figure that stuff out, too. This is bitter. I should spit it out. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> Right, like, Weird. like, yeah, all animals can just walk around and eat whatever they find, and they're like, okay, this is good to eat, I'll eat it. And then that gives them energy for their body and allows them to grow, and, like, it's just crazy the way that everything works on Earth. 
and like within mm-hmm. her own bodies and within the planet as well. It's it's crazy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that that scientists will ever stop being like fascinated by that kind of stuff. You know, I'm sure there's more I breakthroughs agree. to happen, but but it's still fascinating how it's all just kind of evolved and it just kind of works. So we have this this huge space tree attached to a a tiny, you know, shell of a planet that's pretty much only there to to exist to create this whole ecosystem of this tree getting nutrients from the ground and water from the ground. And maybe the humans have to go out into space, find nutrients and bring them back and then put them into this this planet, this like little uh bulb that the whole thing is growing out of. Oh, interesting. Like there are some things that are a little bit more at stake. Sure. That's like having a big plant in a small pot. Like it's just gonna die, um, just because the root won't have any anywhere to to go to. Or maybe the humans have to keep adding on more dirt to the outside of it. I don't know. I don't know how this whole thing's gonna stay together. But um, I feel like you could almost do something like uh, if you go to like the topmost branches, you could uh-huh. get like into space pods, and then there's some kind of activity where you generate something mm-hmm. that you then bring back to the tree. So I, I love the idea of going out and harvesting resources, and I feel like. Before we start, you know, pr- uh, production on this thing, we should do some research on that. Like, <laughs> like, do scientists have plans on like where we're going to get nutritional things, like minerals from space? Like, because they're probably mm-hmm. like based on how dense our planet is with like nutrients and minerals and stuff. I would imagine there's some of that crap floating around in space. Like, we just got to figure out where to go get it from. <laughs> and you know, maybe <laughs> it's gotta be somewhere. <laughs> it's got to be someplace. Maybe it is. We have to touch down on other planets and like start mining and doing all these like devastating things to those planets, which is. Uh, you know, pretty human of us, but not exactly uh, sustainable. So that could be that could be one of the missions. You know, maybe you have to fly to another planet and figure out a way of sustainably taking stuff from their planet and bring it back to ours. And we're like, this is you know honestly pretty crappy of us to do because we did this to our own planet and now we're living on a giant tree in space. <laughs> you know, like it's not a good idea. But we kind of have to get more resources. We have to keep growing. <laughs> It's kind of that's crazy. interesting. Yeah, and that's yeah, that's sort of like not black and white morality, of right? It, where it's just like, well, we have to do this, but mm-hmm. like we have to find a way to do it well, right? And that's a, a very human thing, I think. Is like, I feel like a lot of sci-fi is kind of trying to balance uh, consumption and progress with destroying the ecosystem by gathering resources. You know, it's finding sure. a balance between those two, or finding a way of of you know getting gasoline without depleting a natural resource like that's pretty much impossible like how are we gonna how's that gonna happen i don't know well the amount of times that i uh starved to death on oregon trail because i killed all the buffalo immediately (laughs) and then my meat rotted oh geez hunting is really fun on those games though like that's the the action peak of those games i don't know there's a lot to the oregon oregon trail narrative if you think about it like going into into the future and into space and you know uh, the the final frontier you know oregon trail is all about the frontier um it's well just, it's very mythical it absolutely it is yeah and it's a very i mean you kind tale. of have to go through like an ego death and rebirth mm-hmm. to come out the other side right you know? and I, I feel like that's within each human's life you know you kind of have to go through that process of of like refining who you are and realizing that these are unhealthy behaviors that you got to kind of chop off certain parts of who you used to be and that kind of thing um harvesting and pruning and all that along the way and then it's also a narrative of each each country's history and the planet's history and oh man, it's like a fractal, dude. dude. <laughs> this, this tree is pretty dope. <laughs> this tree is pretty dope. Um, so something that's been popping in my mind as far as like I, I know that we're trying to wrap a theme around this, but have you heard of the tree of the Sephiroth before? And I'm not talking about the Final Fantasy Seven. Long, okay, thank long gray haired guy. That is a really cool word that they used for this guy's name, but it's like a um like an ancient philosophical thing. I'm not sure if it's from a specific religion. Oh wait, here it is. Uh originally the spirit and soul of Chadism. Is that a bunch of bros who got together and had a religion? <laughs> yeah, Chad. What's... Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Dude, my buddy Chad told me this cool thing one time. <laughs> you know what Chad Chad-ism. says about that? <laughs> what would Chad do? <laughs> WWCD. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's, it's this like kind of geometric symbol of a bunch of circles that are connected with straight lines. Um, Mm. this definition from 
let's see, sacred-texts.com, uh, the Sephoric tree, I'm sorry, Sephirothic tree consists of 10 globes of luminous splendor arranged in three vertical columns connected by 22 channels or path. They are called the, the globes are called the Sephiroth and they are assigned to the numbers I through 10. What? Maybe they mean one through 10. Yeah, I don't know, but it's just this kind of like philosophical thing about balancing all the parts of life. And it's structured mm. to look like a tree a little bit. And it's just a really cool word, uh, Sephiroth. So it'd be kind of cool if it, if we use that kind of, um, that lore as part of the like ancient history of this thing or something, or even just like a metaphor as we have this one tree, this is our whole spaceship. Um, we need to imagine that it contains all these important things that are key to human life, even if they're not actually contained there, because this is our last chance, like that kind of a mm. thing. Oh, actually, yeah, it's all balancing. Right. And that reminds me of uh, a Disney attraction, uh, Spaceship Earth. You know, that's the oh, yeah, whole yeah. idea is like this Earth is our our planet. You know, what I mean, this is our spaceship and uh, it's our only one we've got. So like we need to that was like the original mission, I think, is is like keep this planet going because it's our freaking spaceship. And what are you going to do if you have no spaceship? We're done. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. The like morals to their stories aren't always present in the theme parks because you know theme park people are there to ride rides and eat junk food. They don't want to be told what to do. You don't want it to be too preachy or anything like that. Sure. It's supposed to be a fun place. But um, I think hey, welcome to Ecoland, jerks. Start recycling. <laughs> You're not allowed to eat today. We're gonna send all of your food to Africa, and uh, four thousand people will not starve to death today. <laughs> you're, yeah, you're welcome. Oh, jeez. Yeah, yeah. That's some some sad stuff out there, <laughs> but. Anyway, this is an amusement park. Um, <laughs> I uh, what if we just what if we just call it tree? The tree of life, the cosmic tree, the seed of the universe. Just, just uh, all lowercase tree. That's cool. Um, there's something from I think it's from Neon Genesis Evangelion. There's like an organization called Seed that's in all caps, and I always thought that was a really cool word, like Seed, especially when it's like seems kind of technology based because it's all caps and it's like mm. in a really nice serif font. It's like, Oh man, seed. It seems like a, a crucial part of life. I like those. I like those, uh, types of names where they feel very like simple mm -hmm. yet like infused with meaning, you know? Yeah. Right. Right. Very true. And it's, it kind of gets to that whole fractal thing that we were kind of talking about <laughs> that came from Oregon trail of all things, <laughs> but, but the seed of life, you know, it's like, that's um, going from zero to one, and then from one you can go anywhere you want to. But it's like that very first step is pretty crucial. And I was mistaken. The seed is is a thing from Gundam, not Neon Genesis Evangelion. I was thinking. Calm of down, Twitter trolls. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I get defensive about my you know giant robot series as well, but um, my bad. <laughs> so the tree is that what we think we should call it? Did you say all lowercase? Yeah. That sounds really cool. It's uh, it it catches the eye. I think. I also like something that massive having such a simple name. Yeah, such a simple, straightforward. Let's go to tree. Because then it's almost like a name and like a descriptor at the same time. Right. By being so simple, it feels like it kind of transcends being called Space Tree Land. Like that sounds like a theme park. This, but tree is more of like an idea. <laughs> what? Yeah. Right. Oh my god. Wait. Or um, what are some other cool tree words? Uh, arboribum. Um, yeah, arbor. The arbor, the arbor. Yeah, that sounds like harbor to me, though. But which I, I almost it kind of is. It, whoa, whoa, oh my god! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's so many cool like sci-fi names you can come up with. I was seeing like a lowercase h in parentheses and then all caps arbor. <laughs> mm. Right. Hmm. I don't know. Do we want to try to to uh, skin an existing IP over this, like intellectual property, or do you just want to go with this original thing? It's just a sci-fi tree. In space. Yeah, I feel like it can be its own thing. I don't know if it really needs another. Because, I mean, the obvious one to think of right now would be Avatar because right. Pandora is hot. Pandora is hot. And Pandora's kind of, or at least Avatar, you know, the first, was all about um, the battle between, you know, technology, uh, colonialism versus, you know, naturalism. Mm -hmm. It was it was Pocahontas uh, in, yeah. in space. Yeah. Or Fern Gully. I like the idea of like the tree having its own technology as well. You know, it's just like there's there's this like seamless integration of yeah. like these these various worlds of like the tree world and you and like mm -hmm. how you interact with the tree world and like maybe there's something else going on that you can't quite see but like you know it's there. So, okay, what about this idea? What if um at some point in the future people start building uh organic robots? So it's mm -hmm. got like some kind of tree matter to it. 
So you know how like a robot is basically a brain with some like sticks coming off of it that it can, can tell it what to do. So if you could grow a tree over that, like um, if you could somehow infuse the the like the tree and give it its own like nervous system basically in the form of a robot, then you could mm. have you know as the branches grow, those are like the legs and they can like move around. Or you can basically monitor how this tree is growing from the inside. <laughs> this is really yeah. trippy sci-fi stuff, but maybe that's what happened a long time ago. There became this tree, not necessarily sentient, but it is a robot as well. And so it can move its branches at will and it can move these like inner chambers in, inside of it to move the elevators around and that kind of stuff. So there's some things that humans aren't controlling. They're Dude. like, yeah, the tree can can just do this sometimes. So we have to learn to live with it. I love that. I love that. The, tr- the tree can't reach all the nooks and crannies. That's what we're here for. We're like serving the tree in a way. That's like it, Hogwarts, you know, where it's <laughs> like, oh, well, that staircase decided to go there today. Right. Yeah, Exactly. <laughs> It's like, yeah, if, if Hogwarts has certain things that it wants, and it's like making the people do that. Because um, yeah. the tree could just cut oxygen production. It could be like, hey, guys, um, you're not making me happy. <laughs> I, I like the idea of having a like a, a, an omnipowerful being that is directly telling you what to do. Or seeing the big picture. Yeah, the, you, can, you can tell what's going to happen if you don't obey. Like, I think that's kind of crazy. Man, we're getting deep on this stuff. <laughs> And I like the idea of the, the tree as being like the leader and it, it kind of makes the decisions. If we want to have that kind of secret narrative about it, it could be something about the origin of this, the robot system of the tree, like the tree's brain, like where did it come from? And maybe yeah. there's, you know, a, a secret uh, group of people who are trying to put a virus into the tree's brain to like... And do, you have to stop it. Yeah, you have to stop it. Or you realize that what they're doing is actually the right thing to do. You know, you find out that these these rebels are actually on the right side. All right, dude, that was a crazy episode. This was amazing. I, I That was really fun. That was a great idea. This was fantastic. Thank you very much for being on. I love the idea of just like, I'm obsessed with the idea, really, of just <laughs> seeing what happens when like, you just have to burp something out. So like, <laughs> what, what, yeah. like, what does your brain do with that? Right. Like, what happens? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's nuts. Whew. Cool. All right. Well, thanks for being on. Um, is there anything you'd like to uh, to say to the audience? Uh, be excellent to each other. <laughs> Aw, there you go. That's great. Um, Nick's show is called What's With You, Scooby-Doo. It's on podcast apps everywhere. And can we mm. go to letsdothis.com? Yeah, let's do this, <laughs> D-O-O. And that'll take you to uh, the webpage. What's With You, Scooby-Doo.com. W-W-Y Scooby-Doo on Twitter and Instagram. Cool. Well, thank you so much for being on. You're uh, always one of the best Dude, guests. thank you so much for having cool. me. Yep, my pleasure. Enjoy the rest of your day, man. I'll see you around. You as well. I'll see you at Tree. Thank you for listening to this kind of different episode of the show. Um, I thought it was a lot of fun to record, though. So maybe we'll do another one like that someday. The next episode will be the finale of Season 2. It'll be the Remodels and Renovations special. Thank you so much for, your, for listening and for your support. It's been really fun to do. Thanks. See ya. See ya.